The title of my presentation is From the Bus Stop to the Courtroom, and this is uh, being done as part of a series of presentations for the Sexualities in Queering the Caribbean component of the course, CCRB 603, uh, being conducted by Ryerson University in Canada. Before I begin, I'd like to do some invocations. I'm Hindu and it is customary that we do invocations before we start any ritual. I would like to invoke the lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, intersex, queer and questioning people. Those who have lived their truth, those who were killed, maimed, penalized for that truth, and those who managed to survive and those who thrive. Those who find a way to live in the Caribbean, and those who've had to leave the Caribbean while maintaining connections in whatever way they could. I'd like to invoke all of those who have taught and who continue to educate me, especially those activists who I might disagree with from time to time, but who have not blocked me from their social media accounts. I'd like to invoke the other people, activists, scholars, artists, academics, allies, religious people, citizens who believe that the Caribbean can be a place which accepts diversity in sexual orientation and gender identity. I'd like to invoke those who practice homophobia in different forms, and I'd like to wish them peace and enlightenment. So appreciations to Dr. Critchlow for inviting me again to participate in his classroom. And the form of this participation is a video creation of the lecture that I would have done via Skype because I was not sure of electricity and connectivity. I'm using a free screen recorder and therefore there will be a watermark throughout the video. It's probably going to be low quality video due to bandwidth issues and there's going to be some problems with audio as I might not be able, as I'm doing this uh, in an environment where there are going to be background noises. Uh, most of the content was shared in a previous presentation to the class in January 2018. Please forgive any quirks and variations in quality in this discussion. So about me, my name is Vidyard Kisun and I eat, pray, breathe, sometimes love and live and work in Guyana. I'm involved in work to promote gender equality, child protection and social justice and use of free and open source software, as you can see from the um, T-shirt. I have been working since 2001 on equality for LGBTIQQ citizens, mostly in Guyana and um, with some connections to the Caribbean. And I have had various roles, including now the coordinator of the Caribbean International Resources Network, which, um, well, I'll explain in some of the annotated slides, which will be shared out as a handout after this lecture. Okay, so in the next hour or less, I'll be looking at the queering of the Caribbean from some of the perspectives I have from Guyana. I want us to look at historical reference to LGBTIQQ lives in Guyana, to look at perhaps how the Caribbean might have been queer, and to you know, bring forward this conversation, which I think I saw from India recently. In India, there was an important judgment, and there was a, someone who tweeted that India is not becoming westernized, India is becoming decolonized. And, and, I, and I wondered if the squaring the Caribbean is part of the decolonizing project. I talk about the laws which exist in Guyana, which are similar to, to what exists in the Caribbean and how people live within the laws. I'll talk about God's involvement in this work. I'll describe, of course, some of the Caribbean IR and resources. And that we can have questions and answers. I hope at the end I'll be available on Skype or um, there'll probably be time to pause and ask questions. It depends on the format of the lecture. So when we Google the Caribbean, and this is a recent um, Google result, image result, here you have the beautiful maps and then blue seas, huts and beaches and coconut trees. Um, and um, you know, the Caribbean is Dominican Republic, Nicaragua, Jamaica, Barbados, Antigua, Dominica and St. Martin. Guyana is not listed there. So Guyana is on the north coast of South America. It's the only English speaking country in South America. So it's linked to the Anglo-Caribbean. It gained its independence in 1966. It has 750,000 or so people who um, live on 
the coastland of 216,000 square kilometers. I mean, the country seems big. Most of the people don't live on the coastland. Our people consist of descendants of indigenous peoples, enslaved peoples from Africa, indentured and other immigrants from India, China, and Europe, and also Africa. Um, we're the only South American country which criminalizes same-sex relations. And oil is being discovered and discovered and discovered and discovered. In this map here, I've just done a map which puts some colors to show um, the diversity within the Caribbean in terms of the legal issues. Um, here on this map, red, which you can barely see, um, shows where same-sex activity is criminalized, especially mostly male same-sex activity. Purple is where there are court cases in progress to deal with some of the laws, not necessarily all of the laws. Blue shows where there's no penalizing or there's been a positive judgment made. Notice that Belize is also included um, in the definition of Caribbean. And yellow shows where there's recognition of gay marriages and partnerships. And typically, these are in the departments of Outremer and overseas territories. And I know, I think for this, Cuba is trying to deal with the recognition of partnerships. So this color might change at any point in time. And if you look a little bit closer at the Eastern Caribbean, here is the, you know, the color separation across the Eastern Caribbean. Now, so when I explain this title, and, and, and I'll talk a little bit more, um, the activism in the Caribbean takes different forms. And um, uh, recently, Guy Bo, an organization in Guyana, started doing a bus stop poster campaign. There are these posters put up on bus stops. Then one of the bus stops was vandalized. And here is a picture of Colleen McEwen, um, who is the, uh, from Gaibo. And she's hanging the rainbow flag there at one of the vandalized bus stops uh, in Georgetown. And of course, um, last week, the court cases, Trinidad has been the most recent country, has to strike down the sodomy laws and making them unconstitutional. And the headlines were free to love, sexual freedom, anal sex between consenting adults is legal, amidst the headlines of the cop and the contractor who were charged for kidnapping. And that is how the Caribbean is. So as we contemplate the Caribbean, and um, remember we saw that map um, just now, you know, those maps which show the different colors, is to understand that in the Caribbean, there are many organizations in those countries, there are several organizations in all of those countries which who, who are working to promote equality and who do so in many different and creative ways. Um, and, and some of them might have started out as HIV organizations, for example. In Guyana, there is the Society Against Sexual Orientation Discrimination, there is Guyana Trans United, and there is GAIBO, which is just three of them. Now, GAIBO had launched, and it said sometimes it's creative ways in which you do the advocacy. So the end of August 2018, for example, Gaibo used this bus stop campaign as part of its um, activities. A series of posters we put up in bus stops and in um, and in other public places. Now, in when in um, now when we talked about the vandalism, right? And the the Colleen had to go back, and, 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 and the media went, and, and oh, I'm using media to show some of the fact that the newspapers and so have tended to cover some of these activities. Now, Gaibo as well, for example, had an encounter with the three uh, main religious groups um, to talk about families, and this is one of the newspaper reports of that um, presentation with the Roman Catholic Bishop Francis Allen. Then there is um, Swami Aksharananda, who you'll hear from later on in the presentation, and Brother Wazir Baksh. 
What was also interesting in Guyana and in the rest of the, in a couple of the other Caribbean countries is that there were Pride events. So Guyana, for example, had a week of Pride activities, which ended with a Pride parade um, one day in June. There was religious objection, but the actual day the parade was well attended and um, well covered in the media. Um, another activity which was held during that um, Pride week was a discussion about families and LGBTQ and um, the relationship with their families. And there was a pride event in Barbados as well, at which a religious Anglican priest participated in. And again, that ended up in a march. Trinidad and Tobago. So in Trinidad and Tobago, for example, there was one month of pride activities, which ended up um, with a march. Um, in July, they used July for their Pride Month, and there was again a big march um, through Port of Spain. In Jamaica, J Flag had a week of activities, um, not, not necessarily the activities, or didn't necessarily include a parade. And later on in uh, Mont in Montego Bay, later on this year, there'll be another set of Pride um, events. Uh, in Jamaica as well. Um, the Jamaica Foundation for Lesbian and Gays, um, they produce what they call the Gay Agenda. And it is a document which details the issues, what they th which they think are important relating to security, justice, family life, health, education, etc. I'll put a link to the document in the um, annotated slides, which I will send out. So it's important to know that, you know, activists are working, um, LGBTQ are, are resisting and affirming their spaces. One of the events in, in Guyana is the, um, the, the LGBT Film Festival, which is now in its 14th year. It's um, organized by Sassad. And, you know, it has been going on. It's covered by the media and attended by a cross-section of the society and of course in other um, pride events and so on they've had other film festivals so there's a range of activism and activities in the Caribbean and I hope that you get to meet some of the different people and they talk about some of the different things so through the list. in Guyana the criminal law offenses act contains a summary uh, sorry contains the, what's called the sodomy laws so section 351 any male person who commits a gross indecency or who attempts to, uh, section 352 and attempts to commit buggery or section 353 um, buggery with uh, another human being or an animal, you know, introducing bestiality. And um, these laws, though, were never used um, for consensual or have not been used for consensual acts for some time. But, um, you know, their existence uh, creates a problem. Um, because it gives the environment of homophobia. The Guyana Sexual Offenses Act has been updated so that um, where these acts are not consensual, they can be at our part of rape. It's considered rape. The other law in Guyana, which is against transgender citizens, is what's called the tra cross-dressing law. And I don't think there are many countries in the world which has these kinds of laws. And basically it says that a uh, any man who appears in female attire or any woman in um, male attire um, for any, any improper purpose. So this becomes an offense. And this offense is part of a set of old colonial offenses which were against poor people. Things like shaking a mat between 7 in the morning and 6 in the afternoon in a public place or in a public way in any town or in any public way flies any kite or plays at any game and there's a whole series of other things like rolling a barrel and so on. Now <laughs> the cross-dressing laws were used in 1968. Here is a reference um, for the young man Compton Bowen um, who is being sent for psychiatric treatment. Now, this is from the archives and I'll probably be repeating, um, you'll probably see a repeat shot of this slide um, later on when I talk about histories. And in 2009, um, some men were arrested for the same and they were charged again. And in 2010, um, four of them joined with Sasa to um, challenge the laws, the constitutionality of the laws. And 
um, there, there are some video profiles, so it would be good for you to watch those profiles um, to, so that you can get a sense of who the people are in Guyana who are challenging um, these laws. This is Angel Sion Clark, uh, Peaches Joseph Fraser, Isabella Sion Posad, and Gulliver Quincy McEwan. I thought I'll share one of the profiles here um, for Gulliver so that um, you can, you know, meet and hear, hear Gulliver tell her own story. Your first attention to me, seeing me going along and you realize that it's a woman passing and then for some reason you recognize it's a transgender woman, what caused you to hate on me? I just find myself early dressing differently from my rest of brother because I'm the kind of person that wants my mom, my mom was very flashy, very outgoing, nice person in comes terms of dress. So every time she went out to associate with your friends and once she buys such a nice garment and soon she, that she took them off when she falls asleep, I would get up in the middle of the night and then dressed in them and then maybe for two minutes look in front of the wardrobe see how beautiful I look in them and then take them off and I could speak on the behalf of my mom and my siblings I don't think they treat me different my sex doesn't define who I am when it comes to my family setting now times has changed a lot from 2009 I could say fairly because there weren't much spaces that I could have gone and didn't been recognized and at that time I think every corner that you walk you would have heard some maybe two to three order in some way negative because of the fact that male the stereotype once they see that you're dressing in a particular form or that you're not supposed they feel that you're not supposed to dress then they want you to lash out in homophobia or transphobia behavior one of the things i did is to do much shutting and meaning that I depend at the time for my siblings to go out and do anything for me just to avoid their attention. Most of my past as a female so I don't have those attention that I do had before 2009. And in Guyana there is not any person that really employ transgender women especially if you dress in female at I express in your gender identity. Well, at one time I had a canteen and I used to, was really good because I had employers, but I think I narrow myself because of the, so much of phobia that I felt early that I felt that it would have been stigmatized and I think I failed to push it more. We're so driven by homophobia and transphobia, you left without uh, income to the end of the month and Lita poverty. Taking the government to court for a cross dressing cases was the most low in hanging fruit because the particular law now doesn't deal with male or female, it's both. It's male and female, the law effect. But what we saw from this particular law, it's only a group of persons being criminalized under the law and it's transgender person. Female are allowed to wear pants, male are going into theater and performing and wearing female attire, but they are not being criminalized under the law. I must know what is the law and able to read the law before I commit an act. I shouldn't commit an act and then bend before the court and then the magistrate decide what is the improper purpose. But for me is to continue to hold on on the first win that we win and the first win would have been 2013 to say okay I do have the right to express my gender identity.
LGBTIQQ lives in the archives related to Ghana. Because this is really important, because in our part of the world, very often these stories are hidden, and you're hearing about all these things about it's new, people are coming, and this is all new, and this is American and Western and white people bringing things to Ghana, which we never had. Now, this is in 1898. Um, Gayotra Bahadu wrote a book called Kuli Woman about her, um, one of her ancestors' journeys to Guyana. Between 1838 and 1917, laborers were brought from India to work in the colonies, the British colonies in the Caribbean, to work on the sugar plantations. And this is one ship on the mercy. This is a record of the ship's surgeon punishment. Nabibok stated that for the last 10 years, he had allowed men to commit acts of beastliness. He had no doubt induced Mohangu to do this criminal act. Nabibak was put in irons, and Mohangu, after blistering his penis, was made to holy stone from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. daily. Holy stone apparently was the ship's language for scrubbing the decks. So this was the punishment under the Victorian. So I talked about blistering Mohangu's penis to protect morality. This was the punishment. Mohangu and Nabibak arrived in Guyana. One was, um, uh, they were both assigned to different plantations. And I think if we continue, to, it would be interesting to find what happened to them afterwards. But thanks to Gayotra, we have on, um, in the digital library of the Caribbean collection, we have images of the notes of this trial and what happened to the, because the ship surgeon was actually penalized for administering too severe punishment. In 1903, 19-year-old Rukmini, who came on the ship the Clyde to Guyana, is listed as hermaphrodite on the um, certificate. In 1959, long before um, Stonewall in the USA, um, there is a report of an all-male wedding of the year, in, in, reported in the in Ghana newspapers, right, on July the 12th, 1959. The bride wore Chantilly lace over slipper satin. Her headdress was a coronet of seed pearls. She was bedecked with diamante necklace and earrings to match. The wedding portrait was taken at Lee's photo of Studio of High Street, where mounted police were called out to control the huge crowd which was gathered there. Later, two platoons of riot squad men were rushed to the wedding reception area to ease a traffic jam. And there was another um, report of a case of um, something about yellow tie men, because apparently gay men... Um, around those times used to wear yellow ties to um, to sort of be their sign. But again, you know, this is sort of written in this way which seemed to show that people existed, people lived, um, you know, that there was this um, wedding happening. And in fact, there was a mention in the, in the extended article of some of the different people who were in, in attendance. In 1966, there is a story, probably sad, of 65-year-old Caroline Vaughan, um, where, you know, it's a 65-year-old patient at the New Amsterdam Hospital. New Amsterdam is the second largest town in Guyana, who's, um, who apparently um, had, um, was born um, neither male nor female, but, you know, lived as a woman, and then on her death, and as she was dying, when the doctors and nurses attended to her, they discovered that her genitals had not been fully developed either way. In 1968, there is this report. Um, you remember we're talking about the cross-dressing law, but a young man, Compton Bowen of Bagotsville, was found wearing a mini skirt on Sunday, and he was ordered to be sent to the Georgium Hospital for psychiatric treatment. This order was made by the magistrate, Aubrey Bishop, um, he pleaded guilty to the charge of wearing the clothing for an improper purpose. According to the prosecutor, on Sunday morning, they saw Bowen strolling along Water Street wearing a mini skirt and carrying a wallet. And the prosecutor said that Bowen was twisting his waist from side to side like a female. And then in 1978, there is a report of this in the Citizen of um, Sex Change Operations. And these two, the, the, it seems as though there were two operations, and, um, you know, the guy's second transsexual in 13 months is now resting at the Georgetown Hospital after what was described as a successful operation. 
the 24-year-old, described as a competent seamstress, was wheeled into the theater a man who came out some 90 minutes later with all of the phys physical attributes of a woman thanks to the surgeon's sharp knives. At last, my dream has come true. And the patient said that she's informed the nursing staff that she'll be known as Sabrina. And again, this is in the public hospital, so to all intents and purposes, Sabrina did not have to pay for this operation. And I understand that Sabrina lives in Ghana, though, you know, lives as a woman and, and does not necessarily want to be interviewed as someone who had gone through this. In 1979, life got a little bit more interesting when a barrister at law, Stanley Moore, in defending a client, and um, he said that, you know, the time was come that Ghana should amend the laws to permit homosexual so relations between consenting adults since the United Kingdom had already amended these laws and this was made into um, you know this was made in court and um, the uh, Mr. Stanley Moore later on became a minister of home affairs in Guyana and then he went on to serve as a judge in the Caribbean and in Botswana and um, and, and in this case, was very interesting is that two police were chasing someone who had stolen and they came across Mr. Brotherson and another uh, man and they arrested, um, arrested them. So, um, I, and then now 2001, um, things became more interesting again. Guyana was going through its um, constitutional reform. Um, the, the, and, and the South Africa had just completed its constitutional reform and South Africa had um, included sexual orientation as um, one of the provisions um, or one of the grounds for non-discrimination in its constitution. So in Guyana, our parliament actually voted in 2001 for an amendment, um, but the president did not um, agree to that amendment because there was a lot of prayers. He prayed was and fasted with a lot of Christian evangelicals, one of whom became his colleague in his political party, the then president, Bal Jagdeo. And um, he, um, so in 2003, the constitutional amendment came back in parliament and then it disappeared down um, one of our um, parliamentary black holes where these things which they don't want to discuss disappear now. In 2005, um, so around 2003, SASA was formed and organized, and the first Painting the Spectrum, the LGBT Film Festival, happened in 2005. And that film festival has continued annually um, since then. In 2010, um, uh, Quincy McEwen and, and others brought the constitutional challenge to the cross-dressing laws after they were arrested again. And very often what happens is that transgender sex workers are doubly penalized. They use the loitering laws and they use these cross-dressing laws to penalize them. So in 2010, this happened, uh, you know, the, the challenge was brought and justice takes some time. Uh, meanwhile, the Universal Periodic Review um, uh, the Human Rights Council made a recommendation to Ghana for equality for LGBTQ citizens. In 2012, a parliamentary select committee was formed to consider the decriminalization of consensual adult same-sex relations and discrimination against lesbians, gays, bisexual, and transgender persons. So these words were actually said in parliament, and that is really important. In 2013, a decision was handed down in a cross-dressing case. And basically, the acting chief justice said it's okay to cross-dress except if it's for an improper purpose and that, um, and that the law is fine as it stands, for, even though there was no, you know, the, 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 and, and, and the case is under appeal. In 2013, a cadre survey finds that 58% of Guyanese are either tolerant or accepting of homosexuality, homosexuals, while 17% are not decided. So there is a, so it's only about a quarter of our population seems are homophobic. So in 2014, um, the first time a government official at a diplomatic cocktail party talks about the difficulty and so on about um, decriminalizing same-sex relations in Guyana. That was um, the then PDP um, gov uh, advice on governance, Ms. Gail Teixeira. In 2014 as well, 
There were protests against violence and the lack of justice for victims of violence and against homophobic comments by religious leaders. And I want to play a news clip here, which shows and brings and shows you of some kind of visibility um, that many of the LGBT citizens um, uh, do to, to get attention to their um, to the discrimination they face. Sexual minority groups say they fear increased persecution and have been speaking out about what they intend to do about it. First in Drake's reports. While President Donald Ramatar is saying that he has no problem with the lesbian, gay, bisexual and transgender community and he is against discrimination towards the group, some members of that group told reporters that they want laws to protect them. Looking at discrimination, which we do know that is all over the world, but um, we try to pull it up more because there's a lot of politicians, you know, who are very serious and concerned about it. Because, and even in the station now, because you need to, you need to get understanding that everywhere you go now, you understand you should not be discriminated, whether who you be or whatever sex or whatever gender. So these are the policy that we're hoping that the president of Guyana can do and look into it, and also those parliamentarians they can revoke some of those old colonial laws and put it in a different bracket now for us. We need rights that any human being could have. We don't want gay rights. We need a right that every human being could have. That is what we're looking for, that we must have a right to speak for ourselves, a right to dress in the way how we feel like. And the community intends to treat with their security more seriously since, in their view, playing their trade is getting dangerous. Try to step up our ability and be more brutal now. And when I said brutal, I don't want people to feel that to me, everybody that are complaints to us, we might do them things or anything, but what we say, we'll, we'll be who we are. At the end of the day, you know, we consider ourselves as men, but we enjoy ourselves as women in our lifestyle. But I'm seeing that this incident has touched us, we decide, no, no, there's a big step. President Ramatar over the weekend suggested that the sexual minority groups not be discriminated against when it comes to employment opportunities and access to government services. The rights group Sassod has called on Ramatar to fire his junior finance minister, Juan Egil, over what they see as hate speech against sexual minority groups. But Ramatar over the weekend said he has not studied what Egil said. Egil had described homosexuality as destructive, wholesome, unhealthy, and told a local radio program it should not be tolerated in the Guyanese society. Reporting for Capital News, Royston Drakes. So in 2015, Guyana and Trinidad had elections, and it was interesting how um, sexual orientation came up in those elections. The manifestos of the two main contenders for Guyana, the APNU plus AFC coalition and the People's Progressive Party Civic, both of them mentioned the commitment of those political entities to putting an end to discrimination against, um, uh, uh, you know, to, to putting an end to discrimination against a person because of their sexual orientation. So um, there's a commitment to gender equality in the APNU plus AFC. Um, they recognize that gender equality is an intrinsic basic human right. We commit to putting in place measures which will ensure that all vulnerable groups in our society including women, children, persons with disabilities, rural and indigenous, indigenous women, youth, the elderly, and the sick and the pregnant, and those marginalized because of sexual orientation are protected and not discriminated against. And in the same way, the, the other party, the people which was then ruling and it is now in opposition, said the same, same kind of thing. We believe that all Guyanese must be free to make choices and must not be discriminated against because of their ethnicity, gender, religion, or sexual orientation. Over in Trinidad and Tobago, the then governing People's Partnership, which is now in opposition, also had in their uh, manifesto, the People's Partnership is committed to all citizens enjoying equal human rights under the law and to ensuring that there is no discrimination on the basis of race, religion, gender, place of residence, political affiliation, or sexual orientation. But then what has been happening from 2015 to now, certainly in Guyana, is this very interesting dynamic where public officials, ministers and so, talk about the anti-discrimination, but there are no real moves to changing any of the laws. 
In May 2015, Guyana had its most recent general elections and there was a change in government. So the new president, uh, David Granger, um, generated this headline in January 2016, President to Respect LGBT Rights. On one of the programs he spoke with, uh, in which he spoke with reporters, he noted that he is prepared to respect the rights of any adult to indulge in any practice which is not harmful to others. And he says that, you know, basically the government um, should be respecting um, the human rights of individuals. In another conversation, he had also said, however, that he does not believe any religious um, rights. He respects religious views. He does not believe any religion should be imposing itself on any other person. The First Lady, Mrs. Sandra Granger, has been on record in different fora, and the First Lady is very active, she's very concerned about vulnerable communities, and she, um, she, she spoke, um, you know, she's on record in the newspaper, and, and this is what the quotation to her, you know, she believes that rights are rights, and that in order to build a cohesive society, we must respect and value each other regardless of race, creed, or sexual orientation. And that, you know, the level of CARICOM, which is the Caribbean community, which is mostly the um, Anglophone uh, countries, that um, there should be some changes. Now, however, um, the First Lady is not necessarily, um, but she might be a leader and be a role model. She's not necessarily a member of the government. Sassad um, has been doing advocacy with ministers, and there are many beautiful pictures of ministers meeting with Sassad and other representatives on LGBT issues. Here is the minister, the then Minister of Social Protection, Valde Lawrence, lovely picture, and there are co um, commitments from Mrs. Mrs. Lawrence, who is currently the Minister of Health, um, on her, um, uh, you know, her her saying that she's opposed to discrimination. And uh, just after that picture, was, um, th this is a, another headline generated by that minister. We're at another, co uh, we're at a cocktail party. Um, she said uh, that, um, you know, she acknowledged uh, the existence of the LGBT community and uh, the problems with discrimination. The new Minister of Social Cohesion generated this headline that he's committed to addressing the issues facing the LGBT community. And in another part, in another um, uh, section, that there was another headline that says that he will defend the LGBT community, right? So we have, you know, again, more ministers talking. There's this interesting discussion from um, the Minister of Foreign Affairs that legalizing homosexuality is no straightforward matter. It wasn't straight. It, it didn't seem to be to um, be, oh, you know, this is evil and people should change and this is against Guyana, but that it is uh, that, um, the, you know, there, there was an issue where Guyana um, has to acknowledge its religious groupings and that um, this was this comment was made just after Ghana voted against United Na funding for United Nations Special Rapporteur. However, it was very measured. You know, he made it clear that his administration respects the rights of all persons, but must take into consideration certain implications before signing on to resolutions. That is not to say the government is against the LGBT community. So, so again, you're getting this kind of, um, you know, we know, but we're scared of these, um, these, these bogeymen, this, this, this God religion. And this is very similar to what his um, opposition counterpart had said in a cocktail party early in 2014, that again, you know, it was 200 um, years, it took years for women and for the ab abolition of slavery. So it seems as though Guyana, no matter how well-meaning the politicians and no matter how much of the donor agencies and the government's liquor that they drink, that, it, that um, they're not really going to do anything, either opposition or government, about changing any of the laws beyond speaking about it. 
Here is a beautiful uh, picture of our Attorney General, and this again is at a Sassard event where there is a beautiful rainbow flag next to the Attorney General. And in these lovely statements, um, which generated, you know, wonderful statements which should not have generated controversy, right, is that um, this is where the Attorney General had announced that apparently um, he announced that there was going to be a referendum on um, gay rights in Guyana. And of course, that generated a lot of concern and outrage. But in this, um, you know, the government noted that the Guyanese people are to decide in a referendum whether homosexuality should remain a criminal offense. Now, but of course, but the unfortunate, you know, the, the thing is, he also said, um, to, you know, in, today, today I implore you to continue advocating for equality and justice for all citizens, regardless of sexual orientation. Be on the right side of history. And this is unfortunate that the referendum generated much more publicity um, than, say, these nice comments from an attorney general who himself has generated a lot of controversy for his behavior in court and for his seeming inability to win any cases. The Minister of State, however, um, after the referendum comment on the, uh, I, I shall wait for that airplane to pass. The Minister of State, after the referendum comment, said that the government never proposed a referendum on, on gay sex laws. And you know, this is, you know, these headlines are interesting. You know, it hits home to what we're talking about. You know, and and. Um, that basically cabinet, the ministers had not discussed the decriminalization of buggery. And I had this vision of, you know, cabinet um, talking about gay sex over coffee and discussing it. But 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 that didn't happen. And then cabinet probably was preoccupied with other matters. And um, and I, and again, in this statement that you, that, you know, um, you know, he, he referred back to the government's position. This is Harmon again, that that the this you know the the, the president, the government's position is that there should be no discrimination against any citizen, and that you know the last official position he maintained, you know, made clear by His Excellency, which is that the government respects the right of any individual to engage in practices which are not harmful to others. And then in for a follow-up with the Attorney General, he promised Sasa to review anti um, the anti-discrimination laws and to protect LGBT persons. And of course, not much has happened since then. But you know, these are nice, you know, it's nice, nice pictures, nice conversations and so are happening. So one would wonder, so what's stopping? And um, this is where we should take on God and, and wondering where God is in all of this. So if so many politicians on all sides of the political divide are opposed to discrimination against LGBTIQ people, then who are they afraid of? Why don't they want to change the laws? It's God, isn't it? So um, here is um, here's an advertisement from 2001 when Guyana was, um, the parliament had actually sort of agreed to a constitutional amendment. Um, the leaders of the Christian community called the nation of Guyana to repent, fast, and pray for God's intervention to stop the legalization of homosexuality. Thus, it will contribute to the destruction of our society. And if, and you know, I mean, as though the society isn't already a mess. And it was a full page advertisement in 2001. And um, so the president at the time succumbed and he did not assent to the bill. Now, it gets more bizarre because in 2017, there's a letter to Donald Trump asking, Christ, you know, again, the same Christians and so asking Donald Trump for guidance and leadership um, to be a beacon on the hill um, to to um, prevent gay marriage and so from coming to Guyana and the Caribbean. And, um, you know, it was this bizarre letter appealing to a man who has been accused of 
so many other things which might not have been which which one would think are sins and then in august 2018 again um this is this year all of a sudden again it was surprising when Ghana was de debating oil and where the oil money would go there was this public statement again issued by leaders and pastors of the christian community in guyana calling for the Ghana to maintain existing legislative provisions because in countries where the laws have been changed um you know the freedom of speech conscious of religion and parental rights of people have been done um, and, and and buggery violates the law of god and so on but there isn't um anything here so much about the destruction of society and it's a very impressive list of people but the interesting thing is that many of those persons who are on that list actually work in the public services sometimes pray with ministers and so in the government at public function who so, so in the Guyanese population how is God um, represented um, the 2002 census had many different religious affiliations and um, it's important to note that whilst there are people who claim to be the only true Christian there are many other persons who affirm different faiths who have different views and who, who are opposed to discrimination and who support change in the laws in the Caribbean some members of the Anglican Church and Hindus and so we will talk about later have all um, called for an end to discrimination so we think that in Guyana you would assume that maybe things are going easy and um, you know that that you know, that, that, that we're getting some progress and that um, the, the, the sections of the religious community have uh, better things to deal with. And then there was this march in August of 2017 where um, Linden, which is um, the third largest town in Guyana, um, there was this march on a Saturday afternoon where a particular bishop who has a large following, um, you know, shouted a lot of... Um, uh, negative comments about homosexuals and homosexuality and I remember one woman who attended the march she, she went to cover it she said she wanted to cry she could not believe the hate and the madness that was being spouted when you know that that, that when people thought that um, things had changed in Jamaica for this week while um, other people are you know, while other pastors and so have tried uh, to change perceptions, um, the famous um, Stephen Anderson, who had been banned from Botswana, South Africa, um, the United Kingdom, can Canada, because of, um, you know, very hateful speech and language, is apparently going to go to Jamaica with the support of some of Jamaica's top homophobic Christians to um, preach and, and spread his gospel of hate. But the thing is, is that... Um, in addition, so, in a, but, you know, that, that in the Caribbean, of course, is that there are religious leaders who, um, who speak out against the discrimination. This is one article here, again, of a Sassel event, which was um, mobilized um, in June last year, and where people like the head of the Roman Catholic Diocese in Guyana, um, they, you know, um, it, you, you know, sp spoke at that, um, spoke in favor of non-discrimination. The head of the Guyana Presbyterian Church also spoke about respect and um, doing away with discrimination. Um, the the are the head of the Anglican Communion in Guyana sent a message, again, um, you know, speaking out against discriminate the homophobic discrimination, and. Um, there was a representative of the uh, a Muslim who, who spoke in her own right, and then um, Pandit Tilak of the Sri Samayapur and Mariaman Temple also, um, you know, spoke against this colonial legacy. So, so there are religious persons who speak in in Barbados. Um, there is um, a report from the Archbishop of the West Indies, an Anglican Bishop of Barbados. Who says that you know don't condemn people and also in Jamaica as we said the Anglican um, the a a Anglican Bishop of Jamaica also said it's time to you know do away with laws 
and to, to, to do away with the homophobic laws. In Guyana, the, um, it has a com there's a complex relationship between the state and religion. And January this year, um, the Minister of Public Health, the LGBT loving Minister um, Valdi Lawrence, had to hold a prayer service. And the man who led the prayer service, Pastor McGowan, is one of the people who had appealed to Donald Trump to stop um, gay marriage from coming to Guyana. So maybe all prayers are being answered. Who knows? So Hinduism is a faith of thousands of citizens in Guyana, Trinidad and Tobago and Suriname. And there are Hindu communities in the other parts of the Caribbean, um, practiced mostly by those who descended from the Indian indentured immigrants. Um, Indian and Hindu traditions record the diversity in sexual orientation and gender identity. There's certainly no punishment like the blistering of the penis or imprisonment. And in fact, the punishment for Brahmin who has engaged in homosexual activity is that he must bathe with all his clothes on. So some Hindus in the Caribbean have spoken against discrimination and have also advocated because also this, this perception that this Caribbean is this Christian place and that must aspire to be this Christian homophobic place. So I want to share with you, because I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with Hindu thought and tradition, I just wanted to share with you these other perspectives, because I thought that um, the representation of the Caribbean should reflect um, diversity. The first clip is a short one. Swami Aksharananda from Guyana, respected uh, Hindu leader, sometimes controversial, um, he had an April an interview in April 2013, and he was asked about his views on um, uh, discrimination against um, uh, LGBTQ citizens. So that's the first clip. The second clip goes to show a little bit of the thought that sometimes has to go into how we understand religion. And uh, this is a clip from Dr. Arvind Singh of Trinidad and Tobago. Um, and he um, is an electrical engineer and also a Sanskrit scholar. And there was a, a conference querying Hinduism, the Alternative Hindu Discourse on Alternative Lifestyles, which was held in June 2015. And I'm glad to play that short clip so that you can get a glimpse of the thought, as I said, and of the ways in which people think about their faith and their spirituality. Here's an example. My, my personal view is that people, um, we, uh, from a Hindu point of view, and personally also, we really are not troubled by people's sexual orientations. It does not constitute an abomination for me. It does not constitute a violation of, as some people say, it, it is a violation of God. It, for us, it is not so. You can't violate God. You can't, you know. So for, for, from a Hindu, per, per, um, primarily from a Hindu point of view, um, there is no, it is not an abomination for us. Um, we are not going to go and um, promote a particular lifestyle. But you wouldn't pronounce judgment? No, or or far from it. We would, not, we would not do that. And I would support an individual in his or her quest for her own integrity. I will have absolutely no problem in saying that I stand by you. Everyone knows what LGBT H is, and LGBT is, and could guess the H is for Hinduism. <laughs> right. So, <laughs> so I'll just take you through uh, two shlokas, and then sort of look at how the the problem develops in the Hindu mind, and what I think should be the framework in which we think about it. The first shloka. Everybody, well, a lot of you will be familiar with it. Sarve bhavantu sukhinaha, sarve santu niramayaha, sarve bhadrani pashyantu ma kaschit dukha bhag bhavet. This is a very universal prayer, it is a universal hymn. May all be happy, may all be free from disabilities, may everyone see only auspicious things, and may no one suffer from sorrow. So there is hardly anybody, regardless of religion or if you are an atheist or whatever, that will disagree with this sentiment. And this is really one of the overriding sentiments of Hinduism, one of the guiding principles, and we say it often in the Shanti path. The second one, now let me go back a little bit, 
you'll see the two things that they frame it in is suk sukha and dukkha. Sukhinaha means a happy person. Dukkha is a sorrowful person. So these are the two things that we are talking about. The second one I want, to, I want you to look at is from Manusmriti. Sarvam paravasham dukkham, sarvam atmavasham sukham. Etat vidyat samasena lakshanam sukha dukkha yohu. So what is happiness and what is sorrow? Anything under the control of your own power, that is happiness. And whatever is in the control of someone else, that is sorrow. That is the Manu's brief definition of what is happiness and what is sorrow. The implication of this, I think, in these issues is that by demonizing, shaming, and even legislating against the fundamental nature of people, we are placing their very being under the control of others, paravasha, which means we are actively creating a society with sorrow of the most deep-rooted kind. And if we want to actively move towards a society where sarve sukhinaha is true, all are happy, then we must continuously strive to create a society where people are rarely limited only by themselves. So this is, in case I run out of time, the thesis of what I want to see, the Hindu thought and how it applies to the issue. So speak out against discrimination without actually changing laws or, or creating new legislation. In 1996 in Ghana, there is a gender-neutral domestic violence act, and there is also a gender-neutral sexual offenses act. Um, a couple of years ago, the Ministry of Health had a policy against stigma and discrimination, which was very clear, though it wasn't, though um, the, the policy is a bit strange in that it had no accountability. The 2008 national domestic violence policy, which um, has not um, been renewed since it expired, but at that time it acknowledged that there was um, domestic violence in same-sex relationships and that service providers had to um, help people who wanted to escape those relationships. The University of Ghana has policies against discrimination and they make special reference um, to sexual preference, th those words, quote-unquote. In 2014, there was a project by UNDP, which is based on HIV, um, and there were municipal declarations by the town councils at the time in Linden and New Amsterdam, you know, which spoke to respecting the dignity and worth of every person without distinction on the basis of race, color, sex, gender, sexual orientation, gender identity, and also to renounce homophobia. So. Um, then, of course, but we've had local government elections since, so we don't know if these um, declarations still hold or if the new councils are aware of them. The 2015 elections code of conduct for political parties said that you know that the polit politicians should not be discriminating against sexual orientation. In other words, making any references to, to you, you using slurs, you using homophobia to to, to um, generate support. And then in 2018, um, this last weekend, I was um, browsing the newspapers, and then I realized that our Ministry of Finance, the National Procurement Intent Agency, the um, supplier registration form has given an option for gender as male, female, or other. And this is perhaps the first time in Guyana, because even certainly the National Census or none of the other um, documents which ask for gender suggest other as an alternative. So this is all interesting and you know it's very much there. So my conclusion just briefly after that hour and for those of you who are still with me is that the Caribbean and Ghana are probably not going to change any laws soon. There is a fear of God but people seem to be finding ways of working around the laws and perhaps in God's sight. Before I finish I would like to introduce you to a couple of Caribbean IRN resources and I'm sure and I will um, be hope to share around a kind of um, sheet with uh, um, some links on it so that you can access those um, in your own time if you're interested.
So we have our website at www.caribbeanhomophobias.org. It is a 2012 um, collection which um, had some reports from activists, um, different, um, and I, I believe some of this is on your reading list is ready. It, it showed some um, creative writing, film and performance art, interviews, and critical essays at the time from Caribbean um, citizens, um, both living in the Caribbean and from the diaspora. Last year, we launched CaribbeanSexualities.org. And again, this has some, um, this is going to be um, an important kind of uh, collection. The first thing is a Write It in Fire tributes to Michelle Cliff. Uh, Michelle Cliff was a poet and um, and author and, and uh, there's our um, some extracts from the Sargasso journal which we had published and uh, there are some um, again some of it is in Spanish we have our digital library of the Caribbean um, collection where we host um, just random bits of archival material and then two special collections, the Gay Freedom Movement of Jamaica. That was formed in 1974 in Jamaica. They had a, um, a, a, a J the Jamaica Gay News, and they tried to have different um, kinds of programs and activities. So this was in the 1970s in Jamaica. But it, 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 it had to, Larry Chang, who coordinated, eventually had to leave. So this, um, you know, here we there's some... Um, different documents um, from that time you know typewriter this is the day before computers so everything was done in typewriter laid out the Jamaica Gaily News was um, sent out around uh, the Caribbean you know things like that and then we also have in our collection I just show you know, I was telling you about Mohango and Nab Nabi Bakhti's story so what we have here are the documents which Gail Trubahadu shared. She collected them from the archives in the UK. And she just shared some details of what was happening um, in relation to that case, scans of those images. So these are just some of the things that you will see.